Joe, how many projects were you considering when um, the opportunity for the automatic hate came across your quote unquote desk or in your inbox? I, I mean, this was the only one. You know, I'm, I'm an actor who auditions and gets work sometimes. So I auditioned for Justin's movie and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get it, but I wasn't, um, you know, considering a whole slew of projects. I would love to be at some point, I guess. That's interesting because people probably don't have that perception of you. Mm -hmm. but, but so there's a lot of waiting time I know in most mm -hmm. actors' careers, but you've also been acting for 20 years despite mm -hmm. you're, you're so young and that's great that you have that body of work. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's funny. I think that it's a misconception that people think that actors are working all the time or have offers on a ton of projects, but I've talked to some some really famous actors who you would think would work all the time and a lot of them are struggling to find work and whether that's uh, because I think a lot of it's because they want to do quality work you know and find quality scripts and great directors and that takes takes time there's only so many well-made movies every year and then there's only so many parts uh, for that specific actor so uh, yeah, I think it's kind of a common misconception that people have that like if you have worked, you must be offered a million different jobs or you must have a lot of different opportunities, but it's, it's, a, it's a hustle at every level, I think. Interesting, yeah. So I think that's, that's something that I wouldn't have thought the answer would be. <laughs> that's, that's interesting to me. Um, in general, then, going back to this, how many projects are you usually considering at one time? Or it sounds like maybe then there's long delays? No, I'm, you know, I'm auditioning. I'm a working actor that auditions for projects to try to get roles. It's not, uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not considering a bunch of different projects anytime. I'm driving around LA in my Honda Accord, signing my name on sign-in sheets and uh, auditioning for people, so. Wow, okay. That's the truth. Do you think sometimes that misconception hurts you and that people may be hesitant to contact you because they'd love to have you in an indie film, but maybe it's, it's you know, a low budget feature or something and they just think, oh, well, he's going to be too busy, but it's really quality uh, production and, and the storyline is very de you know, deep. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure that there's stuff that my, my agent will filter out, maybe. I, I don't even really know. I haven't ever asked her really, but I think that, I think that anything that's of a high quality will, the cream rises, you know. So I think that if you've got a great script uh, with a really talented filmmaker, if it's a small budget, I think you'll still get great actors because people want to do good work. Just switching gears a little bit. So when you're developing um, a character, let's say you have a little bit of a composite of who they are. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to ask yourself about the story and about who the person is? <sighs> Trying to figure, d dig into what's there. Um, for Davis, uh, and you know, I knew that he was college educated and um, came from a well-to-do Boston family, highly educated parents, uh, working in academia. Uh, but he's chosen to become a chef, uh, much to the dismay of his father. So that was sort of a beginning, uh, kind of a thread that I could pull to unravel um, his, who he is, you know, he's, he's clearly uh, thoughtful and bright, um, but he also has a bit of a rebellious streak in him. And I think it's maybe a little bit more tactile than his, uh, his more intellectual parents. Aside from her beauty, why do you think Davis, that's the character mm -hmm. you play, is so drawn to Alexis? Uh, I think that he's drawn to her uh, carefree uh, lifestyle. And um, I think that, well, I think first of all, he's very curious about this mystery in his life. Does he have an uncle? Does he have uh, cousins um, that have been kept from him his whole life? And if so, then why? So I think that that is something that he's very curious about. Um, so I think that he follows her to figure, to figure out that, but then also becomes very attracted to her. Uh, and I think that aside from 
her beauty. He's attracted to her uh, way of conducting herself in the world, which is very much to the beat of her own drum. Um, and I think that something that Davis struggles with in his real life is the societal constrictions um, that we all have to agree to to live in civilization that you don't have to agree to as much if you're living out in the woods. Sure, and I think in different families too, there's different pressure. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, if you come from a, from a, a very successful, um, both of his parents are very successful psychiatrists and professors, so I think that there is that burden, you know, to rise to that. Uh, while I think that it's interesting that he takes an entirely different route by um, going into the culinary arts. Right. And at one point it's referred to as, oh, you're going to do that cooking thing. Right. His father's so dismissive. <laughs> I know. Well, that's a Richard Schiff uh, improvisation, I'll have you know. So he was getting into it. Um, yeah, I think that he's very dismissive of that as uh, a lesser profession, which is not how Davis feels. I think Davis finds it um, meditative and, uh, and, um, and it's really interesting. I mean, I got to spend some time in the kitchen with uh, Johnny and um, Phil, who run Nicoletta's, which is the restaurant that we um, shot in for the film. So on the weekends, they would let me just come and hang out as they were uh, cooking. And it is this sort of it does have this meditative feel to it. You know, it's it's hectic, but they're just kind of in the zone, out of their heads, getting their food out. Uh, it was fun. I completely understand why he would be drawn to something like that. And at the same time, they need to be on point about so many things, very organized. Mm -hmm. And Phil owns the restaurant, too, so he's, he cooks and he owns it. Oh, wow. So do you normally do that for a lot of roles, kind of really immerse yourself into that world? If I can, yeah. I mean, I think that it just helps so much. It's so scary every time you decide to take on a, a movie and a part and you want to do right by the filmmaker and the writers and everybody else who's, you know, the producers put so much work into it up, into, up until that point. And so I think that uh, by trying to sort of immerse yourself as much as you can in the life that that character is leading, uh, you get little clues from doing that. Um, and it can kind of help guide you to figure out who this, this person is. I, can't, I find it really helpful. But some people don't, you know? Some people just don't believe in any of that. <laughs> any of that. But for me, it's, it's, it's so... You want, for me, I want something that I can kind of something concrete that I can understand about the character that I can fall back on in a moment of, um, of uncertainty. I think you said in a prior interview, Joe, that sometimes um, Justin would scrap a scene if it wasn't working mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just let's start from scratch. So how do you regroup after that? I mean, that's great. If it's not working, why, why keep going with it? Yeah, you know, Justin and I did a lot of talking about the script before we got on set. Uh, so that once we got on set, we could just go, which is the way that I prefer to work and the way that Justin prefers to work. So, you know, any questions you have, get them out before so that once you're on set, you can uh, just be, you know, in the moment and comfortable that, that, that the scene's going to work. Um, but there was one scene on our last day, the scene where, uh, where Davis and um, Alexis first meet. It just didn't have... Uh, it, it almost like didn't have an end. And Adelaide and I had both auditioned with that scene. Um, so we never even really discussed it before we got to set. It was one of those ones that we just kind of figured would work because we'd both auditioned with it and it worked in the room. But for some reason, once we got on the set, it just wasn't really working and we shot the master. And then Justin came up to me and he was like, this isn't working. I was like, I know, what do we do? And he said, you need to tell her to leave. You need to just say to her, you know, you're freaked out. You don't know what's going on. She's got to get out of there. And that's what worked, you know, to, to, to bring the scene to an end, to add that bit of conflict, to get her out of there. Uh, and so we actually shot 
a different version of the scene for the rest of the coverage, um, which is cool. It's a testament to Justin's uh, adaptability. Is that something that you normally experience as a director will kind of ask for your input or also just when you all have a gut feeling like this isn't working, let's mm -hmm. just say it, you know? But yeah, usually. That, uh -huh. Yeah, usually. Um, you know, it's a touchy thing sometimes. You don't want to overstep the bounds, but it sounds like with no, Justin. No, yeah, I certainly don't want to overstep my, uh, my bounds, although I probably do it all the time. <laughs> Uh, because if some, you know, if you're feeling that it's not working, you yeah. have to. It's it is my job to say something, and if I think that there's a way to make the scene better, then I it would be a shame to miss that opportunity. Uh, so uh, it's. I mean, I don't. I don't want to say it's unique. I think that it's pretty common with filmmakers who know that there's that there's that X factor, there's only so much that you can plan for. You can have your absolute best script that you can have, you can have the best casting you can have, and everybody can be on the same page. And once you get the scene up and on its feet, it can become something entirely differently, you know, entirely different, or it can um, pull one way or the other way. And I think that uh, some of the filmmakers that I've really enjoyed uh, working with like to go with that and and uh, feed that like a uh, elasticity. I'm just wondering if there's anything that you're grappling with right now that maybe you can put out to our audience too that might be in terms of acting whether it's booking roles finding mm -hmm. meaningful roles that you really love um, time management anything <sighs> creatively? Finding, finding good work yeah it's not it's just not that easy there's not a lot of great films that get made every year um, and of the films that are really good that are made, there's only so many parts for somebody like myself. Um, so I'm just constantly looking for good filmmakers who will have me uh, on their sets, and I've been pretty fortunate so far. But there are there are long periods of time that you don't work for, and you start to get depressed, and you start to question what you're doing, and question your ability, um, and um, and I, it, it always happens for me in the absolute lowest moment that I'll get a good job. Uh, you know, when <laughs> like all hope is lost is when, you know, I'll end up getting to work with one of these great filmmakers that I've been fortunate enough to work, to work with. Um, and it is, there's just a daily grind to to trying to be an actor. It's just a, you know, it's, I think it's something that a lot of people want to do. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hustle, but it, um, high highs and low lows uh, and those highs make it all worth it. Are there certain things you do to keep yourself high or do you almost enjoy, because I know some people really almost enjoy the, the low because the high is so great mm -hmm. or it also keeps them, it, it kind of gives them material for or, or a mindset that they can tap into later. Well, yeah, that's so true. It's those lower points, you know, where your money's running out and you're not getting to do the creative art form that you love that keeps you satisfied. Um, those darker moments probably do inform the work in a in in a really great way. Um, but that being said, <laughs> would I give them up for <laughs> more opportunity? Probably, yeah. Uh, and you know, I've got just really wonderful group of people around me. Um, you know, so so that's nice, obviously, to have good friends and close family uh, to kind of keep your your spirits up. What are some of the things you do to keep, do you go see other films, do you read, do you like to read a lot? Or? I read a lot, um, I go see films, um, I'm married now, we have a dog. Nice. Oh nice, <laughs> It's nice. not really an activity, I but love it. Married it with pets, yeah, yep. we know all about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I try to travel a little bit around California, I really like going up and down, or up the coast. Um, yeah, and then and then there is the day to day of uh, of reading scripts and deciding whether or not it's something that you want to to chase after, um, and that sort of 
you have to always be ready for that because you know it could be two weeks where nothing's happening all of a sudden you look at your phone and tomorrow you have to audition for some iconic filmmaker and you just have to be ready to do that do you find that getting out of LA you talked about a road trip mm -hmm. or whatever really kind of helps you put things in perspective because in this little microcosm here everybody's so focused about yeah. This thing that's in front of them. Getting out of LA really helps me to, to to clear my head. And also I think that being from New York, there's this this sort of misconception that people have where they say, okay, I'll, I'll go to LA for, you know, three weeks. And if I get something, I'll stay. And it's just really not the way that it works. It's a war of attrition. It's You've got to dig in and, and commit to where you're going to be, whether it's... Uh, LA or New York and I've gone back and forth between the two a lot but I'm enjoying it here and I now have really good friends here uh, who also some are actors a couple are actors and they were very supportive of each other in that in the struggle that is trying to find uh, good work and good projects any apps or technology just switching gears a little bit that you use that help organize your day or that you can't live without that are I'm pretty technologically illiterate um, <laughs> I mean I'll I have to make audition tapes sometimes so I have to figure out how to get the uh, the tape from the camera to the computer and send it out which was like big for me to be able to figure that out I'm, I really don't like yeah I don't have any social media uh, tools or anything like that um, I read the news I read the New York Times and the Huffington Post sometimes, but I so those apps I guess on my phone I use. Do you feel pressure to be on social media? No, not no? at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't look. You know, I know that people ca there's a there are studio movies that are casting that are they'll you know look at your Twitter followers before they look at your tape, you know, and I totally get that, and that there's nothing wrong with that to me, but it's just not. Uh, uh, it's just not the way that I'm interested in being cast. So, it's and it's also not it's something I'd be good at. I don't think I'd be good at garnering a following of people by tweeting out what I thought that morning. It's just not for me, you know. Um, um, so, no, I've never felt, no one's ever said to me, like, you know, maybe Justin, <laughs> it would be easier if there I was. something really wrong with Really wrong with what? Looking at your Twitter phone before looking at it, your tape. Oh, yeah. Sure, there's that's, maybe something wrong with that. That's awful. No, but I've heard stories of, you know, producers sitting in a room with headshots and the number of Twitter followers underneath and deciding, like, okay, you know, the director really wants the actress with, you know, 1.2 million Twitter followers, but the studio really wants the actress with the 3.5 million Twitter followers, and where are we going to settle? Uh, it's you know and what's funny is the movie that I'm thinking of was a complete disaster I mean you would never even heard of it and it was a huge movie and um, there was a friend of mine who worked on it and he was just watching this process and he was just thinking like this has got to be a recipe for disaster so it's not a rat race that I think I would be any good at so I'm not uh, interested and lastly, what what are you reading? Not what are you wearing. Uh, what are you reading? I am <laughs> wearing, wearing Levi's. Everything I think I uh, read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I've been reading mostly. I've been on a pretty big tear of reading um, books about the our two most recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and learning a little about a little bit about the people of those countries and what led to our country doing what it did, what led to what happened to our country uh, that led to those things, and just trying to understand understand what happened, understand the toll that it's taken that I don't think that people really understand. I mean, because it's not, a, because it's no longer a draft, um, our lives aren't affected in the way that the lives of the family, specifically in places like Kansas and Nebraska or lower income uh, communities throughout the country where um, a lot of people are recruited from, um, 
it's taken a very heavy toll and people have come back from these wars um, struggling and it's really not something that I think is being addressed um, to the extent that it should be and I think that so that's something that really interests me um, the prison system is something that really interests me going from the you know starting with the the war on drugs uh, uh, going from the war on poverty to the war on drugs um, and then this world of mass incarceration that we're living in that's very uh, racially um, imbalanced and so that is something that um, I've been interested in for a while so I'll, I'll read that sort of stuff just light reading you know whatever I can pick up sure. at an airport no uh, so those are the two topics that have been um, recurring for me for whatever reason when I go into a bookstore it just seems to be what I'm, I'm drawn to there's a great book called The New Jim Crow that's about um, uh, about the prison population and uh, there's a couple really great Iraq war books that I could tell you about later if you wanted but <laughs> well do you think you'll ever write a part for yourself in a story about that since it sounds like that's what you're drawn to instead of something that maybe um, you know, it's a heavy topic for a lot of people it's a heavy topic it's not something that's been explored the way it was after Vietnam because of course Vietnam was the draft you know so everybody was being affected and 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 the and the president's hands weren't as free as you are with a with an all-volunteer army because uh, you have to answer to all these people who don't want to go to war as opposed to people who theoretically do want to go to war I guess if you join the military but that's a different thing but um, but will I ever write myself apart I, you know I'm I'm not a great writer uh, and I've worked with some really great writers and I've tried my hand at it and maybe it's something that as I get older I'll get better at but I've got such tremendous respect for the screenwriters that I've worked with um, that I kind of t tend to stay in my lane um, just because you know and, and the great filmmakers I've gotten to work with it's not I, I'm an actor you know and I want to be an actor and that's kind of the top priority for me so I would love somebody else to write a script about it I mean it's something I'm very interested in it's 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 a topic that movies are uh, are starting to um, explore people returning from war but mm -hmm. almost in like um, a, not fully like a, you know you'll have a movie that maybe has uh, a, a returning war veteran but it's also it's often very contrived and sort of uh, stereotypical mm -hmm. and I don't think we've had a story like Hal Ashby is coming home or like the deer hunter uh, uh, yet yeah, uh, deer hunter um, so we'll see we'll see if anybody starts making these movies I'm interested to go see them I don't know if they'll necessarily make as much money as they'll cost and so that's always you know why people make movies so we'll see a lot of foreign films though I think are foreign films yeah taking because it's less I say this yeah there's less bring them home you know like, there's less that attitude well also the you know f uh, like there's there are film commissions in other countries so you know Ireland or Denmark or Australia has a film commission so you can take a, a, a a film that isn't maybe so commercial and get government support because it has a message that a committee I guess determines matters so I think that that helps a lot in in those uh, foreign films there's a really beautiful um, I believe it's a Danish film called a war that came out this year yeah, love really it great movie did you see amazing. it yeah so good amazing yeah. yeah and I wondered if it wasn't made in Denmark if it was made here, how it would be received, you know? Yeah, and what did it cost, I wonder, and what is it made, and right. all those things that, you know, the questions that people ask before they make movies. Right, well, 
One last thing, just wrapping up. I know um, Sebastian Younger has talked about um, mm -hmm. men and women coming Love back. Love his work, yeah. Right, from combat, and he talks about... I think about I own one of his um, photography books. Yeah, he's, um, he's amazing, and, and he had Love a documentary, Restrepo. or he had two, aside from, he had Restrepo, and uh, forgive me, the other one is, is, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but in it, he talks about people returning from war and their levels being blown out because they're so used to being under like high stress, mm -hmm. and that nothing is ever really the same. So taking that same analogy, when you work on something that's so, like, you just feel like this adrenaline kind of pumping and then you have to go back to sort of normal life. Do you ever feel sometimes like your levels are maybe blown out because... Totally. I mean, uh -huh. nothing compared to people in war. Sure, you know? sure. No, but, yeah, uh, yeah. But there is, when you work on a film, <laughs> there is there's a community that you develop. You know, mm -hmm. you become very close. You become a family. You get to know people very intimately and they become your close friends that you're seeing every day. Right. Um, and you are full speed ahead working to make this project the absolute best version of itself, you know, the best that it can be. So there is definitely a funny come down period after. And I have to be careful about easing myself um, back in. Uh, so, but it's, you know, I've, I think it was much harder when I was younger, especially when I was, uh, when I was working when I was a child, when I was a kid. So I would go off and get to be around adults all the time and have like three hours of on-set tutoring rather than a whole day of school and I got to work, which is what I love to do. You know, I've really enjoyed acting from when I was from when I was a kid. That's why I did it, that's why my parents supported me in doing it. And so to go back to school in my suburban town wasn't quite the same. So that was, a, it was a big culture shock when I was younger, but now that I've got a community of people in film uh, around me that understand, it's, it's easier to, to come back to.